Welcome, welcome, welcome to Health Issues. I'm your host, Chris Sylvain, and, and truly we're excited uh, to be here today. Uh, a great show, uh, very, very important. As you know, we're focusing heavily on criminal justice and high incarceration rate, the entire prison industrial complex here in Louisiana, highest incarceration rate in the world. But we have two guests that uh, really doing some great things about it. They're from the Vera Institute, and we'll let them tell you about it. We have Mr. John Wool, who's the director, and also Miss Elizabeth Simpson, who's the project director. Welcome. Thank you very much. Appreciate you having you. And uh, tell us a little bit about the Vera Institute. Well, Vera, as you know, is a national not-for-profit organization. It has offices in New York, Washington, New Orleans, and most recently Los Angeles. Okay. We've been here in uh, New Orleans, at least had an office here for a little more than five years, although we started work here in late 2006. Okay. And we work with the criminal justice leaders of the city to improve the delivery of criminal justice in a number of ways, not by any means always, but we have close working relationship with the police department, the sheriff, the district attorney's office, the municipal court and the criminal district court, and the public defenders. And we do a range of things, including pretrial services, which is our biggest project to date. Okay, sounds good. And Ms. Simpson, you focus on pretrial services. That's yes, that's correct. Tell I was, us a little bit about that. Um, we uh, began the planning process for pretrial services in early 2011, late 2010, under a grant from the Department of Justice, Bureau of Justice Administ um, Assistance. And um, we worked again with the criminal justice leaders in the community to uh, develop the program to determine what it would look like, who it would serve, uh, how it would operate. And through that process, we uh, came up with a program um, which does, as it does generally in the country, assess individuals for their risk. So when defendants go to court uh, after their first after they're arrested, they are assessed for risk. The information is developed and provided to the judge so that the judge can make a fully informed release or detention decision at that first appearance. Um, and, and that decision can be based on the risk that the defendant poses to either not return to court or to reoffend. And And what this process does is move the system towards a risk-based system as opposed to a money-based system where it, it, in exclusive reliance on financial bond can result in low-risk people remaining in jail just because they can't afford the bond. Yeah, but isn't it, um, it, 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 you know, we've heard that it's like a, the old debtor's prison where poor people go to jail and rich people stay out. So your system actually is attempting to, your program is actually attempting to correct that uh, somewhat that, um, it's not the, the, the content of somebody's wallet, but their character. Exactly, exactly. And, and of course, there are going to be some people that, um, that are high risk and need to be retained in jail prior to trial because of the risk that they pose. But this moves to a risk-based system so that if they are low risk, regardless of whether they have money or not, they're able to be released prior to trial. Question, though. Why? Are you guys needed? Why shouldn't the system do that anyway? Well, um, part of what we do is collect the information. Currently, there's not a process in place uh, other than pretrial services to interview the defendants and collect the information on their stability in the community, what their family situation is like, what their uh, employment situation, how stable they are in their residence. That typically is not collected except by a pretrial services agency. And, and also, if I can add, mm -hmm. it would be difficult, if not inappropriate, for the police to ask these questions of an arrested person or the district attorney or the court to ask these questions or the sheriff's office. So as an independent entity that's neutral, we can collect this objective information and do what we have experience doing, use statistical tools and otherwise to create and implement a risk assessment tool that gives carefully calibrated information so judges can make better decisions. But it's easier if it's an independent body collecting this information. It doesn't get into all sorts of legal uh, 
problems for the defendants or the case. No, I don't have a problem with the independence <coughs> of it uh, or, or the, uh, uh, that part. But I guess the alternative to me is, wouldn't the alternative if not be legal but immoral? To have uh, one of the actors asking these questions? No, uh, to not, not to have a pretrial services oh. program at all. <laughs> you, you can make that argument. I say illegal. Oh, you're saying, well, it might be both. Uh, I, think, I think there's no question that judges have an obligation to use uh, a full range of information to make an individualized decision in each person's case whether they need to be detained or not. These are people who are not convicted of a crime, let alone formally charged with a crime. So there needs to be clear grounds developed in an objective fashion for them to do that. So it certainly helps them fulfill their legal obligations. From a constitutional standpoint, innocent until proven guilty. Now, was, isn't there something in the Constitution about keeping somebody un, unreasonably long without taking them to trial? I think uh, if I can remember back from old uh, high school, uh, is something about that in there? It's true. And and plus, as John was alluding to, the, the sort of corollary to that is that because you're innocent until proven guilty, you're entitled to be uh, held under the least restrictive conditions that are necessary to ensure return to court and public safety. So if that if if you are low risk, least restrictive probably means that you're entitled to be released on your own recognizance on a promise to return. Okay, all down if we go down Tulane Avenue and believe me, I'm a little biased because I know a little bit about Tulane and Broad in that area for a lot of reasons. Uh, but if you go down Tulane Avenue and it, particularly if you go down Broad, we have about. Uh, 10 zillion bail bonds operations. What does that have to do with what you guys do? Well, in, in almost all jurisdictions in the country, whether there's pretrial services or not, there's uh, a role for commercial bondsmen. Only four states don't allow commercial bondsmen. So there's definitely a role for the commercial bondsmen. There are going to be cases where uh, uh, it's appropriate to set a bond, that they're not because of their risk factors entitled to simple release and they're not so dangerous that they have to be kept in without the opportunity to make a bond. So it's natural that there would be a system in place for allowing people to bond out and that's the role that the commercial bondsmen play here. But if you guys are doing the pretrial services and we're going based upon the content of character and not the money in a wallet, the bond is dealing with the money in a wallet. It is, but um, but there are individuals who are of a a higher risk. Maybe not so high that they need to be detained, but high enough that a judge feels there has to be something other than a promise to return. And in that middle area, um, sometimes supervision services are appropriate. So that's just an area where. Um, a judge may order electronic monitoring or some other type of supervision, but sometimes in that middle area a financial bond is, is used. And in fact, pretrial services could have some impact in moving bonds up in the sense that we, are, we not only are identifying people who are lower risk, we're also identifying people who are higher risk. Okay, but the question then is that bonds are not based upon a person's income or assets. The bonds have no relationship, so therefore the richer people can pay the bond and the poorer people can't. Wouldn't it be, to me, legal, or at least moral, if some kind of way we can line the bond up with a person's assets and money? Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I, I think I'm if not Bill Gates got arrested, I think his bond should be 10 trillion. <laughs> and, you know, an unemployed guy, you know, 50 cent might be high. And, and I think that's actually right. the, the statute uh, does allow and, and does suggest that that's an appropriate consideration in setting the, the is amount of the bond. Is it done in real life, though? I would actually say it is, um, especially now with the judges receiving more financial information from the defendant than they had previously as a result of pretrial services operating. They're in a better position to gauge the, the bond amount to the financial ability to pay. Any studies done on it? Not here. Um, I, my guess is, but I can't say for sure that there have been studies done elsewhere. And there, there are certainly jurisdictions that more closely focus on that question. And the federal system largely sets bonds with a lot of information about the defendant such that the bond is tailored to the defendant. So, and it has to be by law a bond that the defendant can make. 
you can't detain somebody in the federal system. Say that again. By law, it has to be a bond that the person can make. That's correct. And in, in all the unemployment. With one exception. <laughs> okay, but it, unless a the uh, U.S. Attorney's Office seeks absolute detention, in which case there's a detention hearing process, and they can, in fact, detain somebody who has then no opportunity to get out. But when, but short of that, it has to be a bond that's tailored to the defendant, and the defendant makes that bond. Now, it could be a collection of cash, property, and the like, but it has to be something. So that's the pure system. They have a lot of resources to carefully weigh all the factors, and they have more time than we have in the state system where we have to do this roughly within 24 hours. But that's that's the pure system that the federal government uses, including here in Louisiana. Well, I'll speak for all the guys in jail right now that don't have the money to pay the bond. It didn't work for them. <laughs> that's true. That's true. Not in the state system. I mean, there are... Um, well, and even in the federal system, the bond has to be set such that a defendant can make it, but um, in some instances that might be pulling the whole family together or something, um, even in the federal system. So there are people that are in federal jail because they haven't made a bond. So that's only in the, so in the state system it doesn't exist really. That's right. It's not practical, but in the federal system, uh, nobody should be in jail in the federal system unless they just want to be because there's a way that they can make the bond. Or the if judge has determined that their risk to society is so great that, that no amount of money will yeah, secure. But, I mean, for, all, for the people who, yes. yeah, yeah, so yeah. Is these guys are sitting in jail, either they don't want to pay the money or the parents have decided, which can happen, you know, it's like, okay. no, you're going to rot in jail. <laughs> I am not going to take and set, you know, mortgage the home to get you out. Right. Uh, but then the states, now, nah, okay, that's where we, we, we're going to move on. But the issue then, though, is obviously we have a bis big disconnect between the state system, the, the federal system, and the municipal system. Because we have a municipal courts, we have state, and we have federal. So then again, is what the state doing immoral or illegal, and the municipality immoral or illegal? Can it, and you don't have to say that, so it's a hard <laughs> question. I mean, you know, but I'm just saying, you know, go ahead, be courageous, they'll shoot you. <laughs> Um, I, you know, I think that a lot of what pretrial services provides is the information that the court didn't have before. Right. So um, there, I think that the judges were um, understandably cautious about letting people out without bonds, without having that additional information. Yeah, they won't get reelected, you know, because the guy who's running against him for election going to say, well, hey, John Doe let out, you know, Sirhan, Sirhan, and they shot up 7,000 people, and so they, then they lose the election, so they're, they're very, so you guys are covered for when they run for election or whatever, and I mean, somewhat right. realistically. I know. mean, even separate from, from winning the election, which of course an elected official probably always thinks about, but even separate from that, they don't want to see that, that um, that horrible outcome. Utopia. I like that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm, I'm not being facetious. I understand. You know that. We're good. We're good. But the issue, though, is that, and, and, and seriously, you don't have to say it. I will. It's immoral, unethical, illegal, it's nutty. It shouldn't go on in any civilized society in the world that poor people have to go to jail and spend more time than people that have money. And it's nutty. And you guys are doing a great job trying to change that. And that's the point. You know, I understand. Y'all are real. So, so, you know, your, your program and, and your budget's been cut, so it's going to get worse. Well, I have to say the judges in the criminal district court have been very good partners in developing their uh, use of the information that we're able to give them. And so I think we're moving to a place where if there's any immorality or in illegality, it's it's marginal. They're they're making use of the program. It's showing results. We we have fewer people who are no doubt fewer people who are in the jail simply because they're not able to afford bond, and not because they're a risk to public safety. Yeah, I mean the numbers of people in the jail in the pretrial population, in the jail are down significantly. It's likely due to the work of the judges using this program. Using your program, the Vera Institute that nobody even heard of. And the reason I heard about it is because your budget was cut. Times Picayune ran a story, budget was cut. You know, of course, me sitting at the kitchen eating pancakes in the morning, jumping up and down. I always do that, you know, reading this. This is nuts, you know. Let's see what we can do to say, well, and, and, and to be honest with you, and, and, and shocking because the story didn't do that. Times Picayune did a good job putting it on, uh, but maybe I didn't read it well. The, the alternative is crazy. 
It is, and, and just, just to be clear, because we have to uh, acknowledge the assistance of a lot of people, the proposal um, was initially to cut our budget, but um, through the work of the, the city council and many people in the community who, who rose up to say this is really important, um, and quite a bit of the money was put back into the budget. There's still a bit of a shortfall, but um, quite a bit was put back in so that we can continue operations, and we and are. in fact, we're going to be able to, as originally planned, and scale up for 2013 so that we're covering all of the sections of first appearance and not just the felony cases that go to state court but the misdemeanor charges under the state law that are presently going to the municipal court so at the moment it's a it's the worry that you had at your breakfast table over pancakes uh, is not week. come <laughs> that's right all week I said, no, it was that, it wasn't the newspaper, it was a computer, because I no longer had the paper, so I have to sit the computer on the table <laughs> and I get the story. Oh, Yeah, but anyway, go ahead. Yeah, but I, I, well, the thing, though, is this. Did you have enough money to start with? Yeah. We, Good. You're we, first agency. No wonder they cut your budget. <laughs> <laughs> Shouldn't say that. <laughs> no, I, no, I mean, it, you have to be honest. Let's be honest with you. So you, the, get, the thing of it is, is that, to me, it's a critical component that, again, if the, the component is removed, you're dealing with illegality, immorality, and every other morality or whatever we can come up with. I mean, it, it's nuts that how do the, I guess I keep going back to this issue why you need it, you know, and, and it still doesn't make sense that something could be cut that's illegal. I mean, you know, it's like taking all the stoplights down in the city of New Orleans saying we don't have money to have stoplights. Well, and there, there is, I mean, we say we had enough money to start, and we certainly had enough money to start, but if you look at pretrial jurisdictions or pretrial services agencies in other jurisdictions, there's a lot more that can be done, and, and we certainly will continue to try to move in that direction. There are uh, agencies um, such as in Washington, D.C., where very, very few people are incarcerated pretrial because they have very extensive supervision services. So um, there's a number of people, of course, that are released ROR, but there's a very large number that are on supervision and some in a more intense form of supervision that includes quite a bit of treatment. Um, so there's uh, really a lot of room to um, to improve. It's not really expand. I think eventually it's uh, really to scale up to what a pretrial services agency should do because of okay, what they can so, do. Okay, so therefore uh, I, I'm with, now is that, uh, now that's the part, Baptist Community Ministries who I think do a great job and you know I'm a little biased towards them because I, I do th think they do a great job. Um, so they helped, do, did a grant to help finance the supervision part. That's right. But to me, now to me that should should not be a part that should be a hospital base, that should be a, a clinical social work. In other words, explain. Supervision means that somebody gets arrested for a crime, they have other issues, drug issues and so forth. Vera Institute's getting involved with supervision, helping them while they're out of, before they even go to trial. So when they sit in front of the judge, they won't be stoned out and, you know, they're dealing with other family issues and so forth. Uh, but to me, how did you guys end up getting involved in that part? Well, um, again, it's, it's not unusual for a pretrial services agency, and it really has both components. It, we do have to be primarily there to ensure that defendants do return to court and not reoffend. So a lot of that is checking in with them, uh, either at our office, at their home. Um, but what we want to do, and, and we're looking at having a very social work um, perspective in this program, is we want to be able to look to see if there are barriers for that individual complying with the court order. So not just look at the fact of non-compliance, but figure out why aren't they complying and can we support them such that they can comply. I had the same conversation with Mr. Leon Canizaro because, and, and again, as a part of his um, program uh, of, of, of bringing in social workers or whatever, I, I said all over again, um, that's not you guys' area to me. You know what I mean? This is hospital. This is medical. This is where, because social work can't be separated from the physician, the nurse, the pharmacist, and it has to be holistic. So it, it, what I see is government, particularly in criminal justice, picking out little pieces, you know, and social workers I think needs to be expanded, but they're, they're grabbing little pieces and then you don't have continuity of care 
because particularly for uninsured people. So, you know, you're putting the social worker in a really, they're, they're, they're sitting them in a cross. They're right. sitting out there on a lifeboat. With, and, and really uh, what, what I'm talking about is a, a, a social work perspective to the program. So we will not be um, so much a service provider as trying to connect defendants with needed services in the community. So we will be working with um, organizations like Metropolitan and, um, okay. and trying to get defendants who need their services into their system of care. Same with Magellan and, and unity for supportive housing, things of that sort. So we won't be so much providing those okay. services okay. directly. Yeah. But it feels a whole lot better. I guess the thing of it is, is that again, uh, you know, I think, it, again, it's immoral, unethical, the whole bit when we take poor people and we attempt to give them health care or social services that aren't, you know, best practices. I mean, would that make that make sense? There's some kind of way we need, you know, people need help if we're dealing with social work issues, let's give them the best social work issues and not patchwork it, I think. So, uh, now, that sounds good. Now, the next question is, so, since we're dealing with that, um, that's where I guess the money becomes unlimited because that's when you're talking about un the uninsured and that's big money there. You have family structure issues, you may have drug abuse, you may have a lot of different issues going on. And so at, at, at what point, you know, what, what are y'all asking for there? Well, I mean, that really goes to the, the bigger question uh, outside of the world of criminal justice as well, that we have right. people that are definitely utilizing not just the criminal justice system, but mm -hmm. our emergency systems, yeah. our homeless Job, uh, shelter yeah, systems. Yeah. And, um, and, and there again, most of the research indicates that if you provide those supportive services directly to the individual that needs them, you are in fact taking quite a bit of burden off of those other systems. So out of the emergency rooms, out of the criminal justice system. So it's a bigger picture look, but most communities that have, have looked at it find that supportive housing with all of the needed supports is really much cheaper than incarcerating these individuals or hospitalizing them but, because they're not getting those services. But again, if, if from society, if we're going to spend money there, or we put in, uh, we spending money after the fact, why not spend it before they commit the crime? Because exactly. we know that if we do take care of supportive housing, because Unity doesn't have enough money, they have no housing, there's no Section 8 people were fighting out there in Jefferson, St. Bernard Parish. You know, there's no Section 8 zero. You don't have housing. People have, you know, we're just dealing with prostitution. You know, people have nowhere to stay. People, there's no health care, uninsured. We're not even getting money for the uninsured. You know, that, that whole bit. So if there is money, to me, let's do it before they commit the crime and definitely after they commit. I I'm, I don't, I'm confused. Well, I, you know, there's no one date of committing a crime. So, in other words, people who are in the pretrial program who would be released to supervision are likely not to have been charged with a violent crime. They're okay. they're likely to have perhaps a drug crime or some okay. sort of property crime. And, you know, in a sense, if you do help them get to the needed services at that stage, okay. it won't be before that charge, but it may very well be before later the series of charges okay. or and even perhaps a violent charge down the road so at some point you do have to intervene even if it's not at the very beginning of uh, before any criminal activity okay the big question all right I was trying to go there but this is the issue most people go to jail for drug crimes okay 70% of the prisons are drug crimes all right marijuana cocaine you know whatever all right marijuana cocaine heroin the three big ones okay now uh, in light of Washington and Oregon, what are your thoughts on this concept of people going there? Do you see judges using common sense and not locking people up over drugs? Well, there's the pretrial question that we're most involved in, and then right. there's the sentencing question that's the one that would lead to prison, as, as your question put it. I mean, there is a long way between decriminalization as some states have done with marijuana right. and more uh, reasonable drug statutes. Okay. Now, judges are oftentimes hamstrung. They have to follow the law and if the, if the statute says the person's convicted for this offense, they have to go to prison for no fewer than five and no more than 20. That's what they're told to do. Pre-trial, they have a lot of discretion. I think we see the judges very carefully focus on violence and um, and understand that drug offenses generally are seen by the community as less of a threat. 
And so it, in, that, in helping us develop the risk assessment instrument, which focuses heavily on either prior violent convictions or the present charge being violent, particularly firearms, that that's where the focus is, to establish risk. And if it's mostly drugs or only drugs, they're going to score lower risk. I, I would just actually make one caveat to that, is that we do have in our risk assessment, um, which is uh, which borrowed heavily from other jurisdictions, but we, we had the input from local uh, judges in the district attorney's office and the uh, public defender's office. We do have extra points if somebody has uh, a, a sort of a, a string of drug-related convictions. So we weight violent crime more heavily because clearly that's a bigger problem in this community and um, a bigger problem everywhere, really. And, and we, so we looked at the research at, at what are the better predictors of violent crime and we weighed those more heavily. But a, a, a pattern of drug-related convictions is also weighed in our risk assessment. That's what I thought. Now, also, um, any studies to show what's actually going on at Tulane and Broad, particularly concerning judges uh, releasing people um, uh, out with low bond or no bond for drug issues uh, prior to going to trial? I don't know if we've looked at it, why. been able because to look at it. My sitting in Tulane and Broad in those courtrooms regularly, lately particularly, a whole lot sitting in the courtrooms at Tulane and Broad. you got tons of folk in Paris prison in there waiting for trial on drug crimes. Mm -hmm. And my point of that, if, if this thing was done properly, there shouldn't be anybody in there waiting for trial on drug crimes. Then we could deal with the legislature. But right now, this is purely up to the judges, so we don't even need to go to the state legislature. The judges can release all of the folk uh, that's sitting in Tulane and Broad on drug crimes until they go to trial. Makes sense, right? Um, yes, certainly um, drug possession. And again, you can't go exclusively by the current charge because somebody could be charged with drug possession, but, but their history may be such that they do in fact present a risk either failure to, reappear, to appear or to reoffend. So um, current charge is important, but there are other factors that one looks at to determine their risk. Um, the other thing is um, the judges don't have complete discretion because the legislature has enacted some statutes that uh, restrict the judge's ability to release people ROR. And one of those is if they On are drug? charged, if they're charged with possession with intent to distribute. Okay, we, we, we have to cut off. This is so fantastic. We, you guys need to be supported. The, the supervision program, each thing, uh, Chris Sylvain, health issues. The key is, is that Louisiana is the highest in the world in incarceration. New Orleans, we fill all the jails around the state from people right here. We got to get people out of jail. What they're doing is trying to help support them. But let's do something serious and tell our politicians that they they need to go take some medicine because this is crazy. Thank you so much.